I want to talk a little bit about what led to the book. I think Armando covered a little bit of it. Um, a bit about what's in it. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the research process and uh, the field work that I did to, to write the book. And because it's not a work of fiction, I'm going to reveal the ending. <laughs> Aerial views tell you a lot. They can show the building pattern in the urban context and how it, but it doesn't really tell you how it feels to be a pedestrian. So this block in Seattle is a good example of that. Those buildings form very continuous street ed edges. But when you get down on the ground, there are a lot of garages and there's not any retail or anything, so the streets are a little bit dead. Or this development that looks great from the air with this sort of formal open space, um, but it didn't feel that comfortable or that interesting when I got to it on the street. Um, and when I visited these places, I did not rent cars. I made a point of, um, of taking buses and public transit. I traveled with a fold-up bike and I, because I wanted an out-of-car experience. I wanted to slow down and look very carefully at what was there. And it was really useful to not have a car because I noticed things that people, um, that you wouldn't notice if you're in the car, for example. The sidewalk with the trees that were planted right in the middle. When I was trying to get up that on foot, I realized just how incredibly dumb it was to put those trees in the middle of the sidewalk. But if you're just driving across the bridge, you think, oh, nice, nice trees. So this is where I went, locations all over the U.S. and a few in Canada, and I checked out all the neighborhoods that uh, rated high on walk score, or had interesting, or had recent infill projects, or an interesting building pattern that was shown in the aerials. Um, and I had a GPS track on my bike. These are the tracks from Vancouver. So as you can see, I circled and circled and circled and went to as many neighborhoods as I could, and I looked for places that were interesting and visually memorable. And I wanted to show whole streets, not just little fragments of the street. So I took a series of photographs every 20 feet walking down the street, and I kept going as long as, I, as the street remained interesting. If there wasn't an empty lot or a big parking garage, I just sort of kept, kept taking photographs. And it was a really interesting process because it made me understand the importance of an, un, an, an uninterrupted street um, of, of an urban fabric. That visual interest that just continues and continues is a big component of what makes a street pleasant to walk along. So I stitched those together into one long montage that gives a multiple uh, one-point perspectives all the way down the street. So it's a sequence, but it's shown it all at once, and it's sort of similar to how, how a pedestrian would experience a street. And this is what you can see in the book. By stitching those photos together, you can see things that are going on in the block, um, interesting intersecting streets, or um, the rhythm of open spaces uh, and building openings along the street. <coughs> and when you hold them side by side, um, you can consider what makes a street interesting or not interesting. Um, the differences between small lot development, like the older street in Denver at the top, and large lot development versus the new infill section of, of Denver, where the whole building covers the whole parcel, which covers the whole block. Um, there's, there's, there's been a real attempt to make it an interesting building, but when it's all the same going down the street, it, it doesn't hold up as well. And it's one of the challenges of, of contemporary developments. How do you make those large floor plates have, have the same kind of visual interest as the older neighborhoods? Or the problems that you come with when there's just not a lot of openings in the building, or, uh, or doorways, or windows. How, how much less interesting those buildings tie together along the street. And how the longest montages show that intact urban fabric. This is a street in Brooklyn where I could just, it never stopped being interesting. Well, it did, but not for several blocks. I just took photograph after photograph when I crossed many streets, and I was able to continue to shoot. And it ended up with one of those six foot long by three inch high <laughs> montages. So I'm going to finish with the five broad themes that emerge from the research and in which the book illustrates. And first is the crucial role of transportation, because how we move determines the, the shape and the scale and the quality of our cities. We have a lot of we have ec environmental, economic, health reasons to drive less. But 
shifting away from cars to other trans to tra transportation modes is the single most important strategy to make s better cities and towns. Um, if, if we're moving by foot or bike or bus or train, we will be able to get the scale right. I believe now, <laughs> after doing this work, I mean, I sort of believe this before, but I really believe it now, that this sustainable transportation hierarchy is the key. Um, if we adhere to this when we have when we have polity discussions, then I believe that good things will come. Every neighborhood that I selected that m that met the criteria um, was built before cars. Um, I didn't really want it to be that way, but it ended up being that way. I think it's because they were scaled and designed for people moving by foot. Um, some had filled in recently, but they were built next to or alongside a historic uh, pattern. I looked for greenfield developments. I looked at lifestyle centers. I went to Stapleton and Denver and Belmar and Arenco Station and many other sort of new towns and greenfield developments. But I couldn't find that critical mass of people and services in close proximity. Now, that might be because they haven't been fully built out or for whatever reason. But I suspect it's because they were built with cars as the primary uh, form of transportation. So if you, if you have the car at the top, then you're going to get, a, you might be able to get a small isolated fragment of this type of neighborhood, but you can't get a whole city and you can't even get a whole neighborhood that has this quality. And one of the biggest reasons is parking. Take for example Cleveland. It's a really great place to park. There are an, a, there's an abundance of surface parking lots. Parking garages are everywhere. It's also a great place to drive because the roads are highly engineered for speed. <coughs> but it's not a great place to be because most of the space is devoted to the storage of cars or the movement of cars. There are a few developers and activists who are really trying to turn it into something else and see the potential to make it into a much greater place and a place to be that's more bikeable and walkable. <coughs> but as long as they have a, 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 the same parking requirements and regulations, they're never really going to get there because there just simply isn't enough space. The places that are succeeding are making bold moves in the direction of that sustainable transportation hierarchy. Places like New York City that res are resetting the priorities. They're not making little baby steps. They're doing big moves. Um, researchers are crunching the numbers on you know how to uh, how to do this, but the New York City New York City Department of Transportation, they're just doing their own experiments. They're, they're, they're out there changing lanes and putting in temporary plazas and then permanent plazas, and they're, they're finding ways to reclaim the streets, and people are responding. Um, and this is not just happening in New York, it's happening in Chicago and Washington and even places like West Palm Beach, Florida. This is Lancaster, California. This is what the main drag looked like in 2007. It was really was a place to drag. And they wanted more people downtown, so they took out this five lanes of uh, traffic and they reduced it to two lanes with a wide tree-lined uh, romblos in the middle and uh, turned it into a boulevard. And they made it safer. The traffic colli collisions were cut in half and the injuries dropped by 85 <coughs> percent. They brought prosperity to downtown, became a magnet for development. They spent 11 and a half million on it and they got 130 million back in private investment. Um, the revenues from downtown doubled, and the property, even though property values dipped everywhere else in town, they rose by 10% in the downtown area. And this is all because they created a place to be instead of a place to drive through. So here's a simple test of whether a development project or a zoning plan or a transportation improvement or whatever it is you're considering is a good idea. Does it make sense if gas, gas costs $5 or $8 or $10 a gallon? Because we don't really think in terms of environmental impacts or long-term future, all those sort of highfalutin things. We really think about pocketbook issues. So if, if, if it's not really going to hold up, if it's not designed to be in a place where people don't have to drive that much or, or um, can't get to where they need to go, then it doesn't make sense. So the number two, mine the gaps, rebuilding the urban fabric. And this is just at the, it is also at the micro scale and at the macro scale. 
filling in empty lots with multi-story, multi-use buildings, so you get that continuous urban fabric. Burlington, Vermont, where I'm from, uh, they're doing that. They want to create more housing downtown. And it looks from the map on the left that the downtown is built out, but by looking more co click carefully, you can see there are many, many gaps in that pattern. There are many opportunities to, uh, to create housing units. And here's an example of filling in the, the, the uh, mall and the urban renewal site from the 1970s with, uh, with new housing. This is what the city is working towards, adding stories and filling in the gaps. So walk score um, was a really good tool for me to use. I checked that first. And these are the cities that they said were the, were the most walkable in the country. And it's where you'd expect. It's the older, transit-rich cities in New England and the Northeast, like New York, Philadelphia, and a few others, Chicago. And increasingly in the Northwest, like Seattle and Portland, where walkability um, has been embraced and, and systematically pursued.